right, everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate those that have registered and participating in today's event. Uh, very excited to be hosting. I'm Blake Snodgrass. I'm the Sales Recruiting and Executive Search Director for eHire, serving as 2020 Society Board Chair and been a part of the Sales Leadership Program since the beginning. Um, but we're very excited to be hosting this event. Um, today's topic, we're gonna talk about how dynamic sales organizations are actively pivoting um, driving revenue and sales execution in the middle of a crisis. The uh, topic itself could not be more timely or relevant uh, when it comes to companies uh, trying to capture that top line revenue right now, they're struggling um, and, and trying to get it back to a state that they're accustomed to. In a lot of cases, they can't even forecast 30 days ahead of them. So we really hope today's content uh, discussion uh, we'll leave you with something, uh, some direction, some guidance to, to go make real-time adjustments for you and your sales organization to keep it sustained and thriving. Um, did want to ask that everybody, you know, stay muted throughout the whole thing. We, we want to make sure that we don't have ambient sound uh, or any kind of distractions as we start jumping into the discussions. I want to start by talking about our uh, society's mission. So we're, we're obviously here to support TAG's overall mission, but we're here to cultivate the expansion of the sales leadership ecosystem across Atlanta. We do that through events like this, informative educational events where we can get sales leaders to get together, collaborate, learn, um, discuss some of the business trends and observations that they're seeing in the market, um, all in an effort to enable them to innovate, achieve, and navigate some of the challenges that they may be facing today. We could not do this without the utmost support that we've received, though, from um, some local Atlanta brands. I wanted to highlight some of the society sponsors. We've got Sales Loft, whom you'll hear from in a little bit, Salesforce, Decision Link, Lessonly, Green Sky, Wide Angle, Altavi, and eHire. We also have a couple social channels, so feel free to follow us. Today's uh, hashtag is hashtag sales leadership. Uh, we've got a LinkedIn group, um, tag sales leadership. We've got content, relevant articles that we'll post out there. Um, you know, happy to take Q&A and get discussions rolling on that platform. Uh, we've got tagonline.org. If you go to the Societies tab, click on sales leadership, you can find updates and uh, news on upcoming events. Uh, as well as updates to our um, sales leadership or sales mentorship program, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Um, feel free to follow at tag uh, at, uh, at tag think on Twitter. We want today's message to reverberate across your network. So feel free to post, share, retweet um, as you see fit. The sales mentorship program uh, is something near and dear to our hearts. It, we're launching it for our fifth consecutive year. Uh, registration is open. Uh, actively and I believe until tomorrow. So for those that are on today's call, I highly encourage you um, to, to jump into the program. I've been a mentee and a mentor over the last several years, um, gained significant value from the relationships built, um, but do want to pass it off to Chris Watkins, uh, who's our committee chair for this particular program. He's helped build it from the ground up and wanted to have him talk about some of the benefits you'll receive, the structure of the program, some of the objectives behind it, so forth. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Blake. Appreciate it. So the sales mentorship program is kind of a six month program. It doesn't run all the time. We have a start and an end date to kind of make it um, easier to manage from our standpoint. The, 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 the objectives are really here. You see on the screen, There's the micro objective is to facilitate relationships and exchanges in, in kind of a networking fashion between mentees and mentors. Um, hopefully, you know, it, it produces some me meaningful outcomes. Uh, a lot of the mentees have specific objectives in their career and the mentors are able to help them, but they're, you know, the benefits go both ways. And then the macro objective here really is creating a greater sense of community ownership uh, in the broader ecosystem of the metro Atlanta and Georgia area. Uh, we really want to try to uh, recruit and retain sales talent in our, in our community. And so um, th those are really the objectives. From a benefit standpoint, a couple of things jump out. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, the mentees who benefit, but clearly mentees benefit. You know, they can um, achieve greater success in their current job. 
explore maybe new new functional roles or responsibilities that that uh, might be available to them in their company. Discover kind of the leadership potential they have with with someone in a kind of a low risk situation, uh, not with somebody that's in their company, but someone who's outside their company. You could really just give them some objective advice. And then for mentors, obviously invest in tomorrow's leaders. Uh, able to learn from next generation sellers is super important as well. Um, I there's I can't you know. Um, overemphasize the fact that as a mentor, I learn through these <laughs> exchanges as well, for sure. So uh, the, what does the program look like? It, uh, the commitment is a six month commitment. You meet once a month for an hour with, with your uh, program partner, whether you're a mentee or a mentor. You do have to apply for the program because we just accept people who are in a sales role. So uh, sales, sales operations, sales enablement, any kind of sales support role, whether you're a rep or you're in leadership, um, all of those things are uh, are, are good. Uh, whether you're currently a TAG member or not, you're still eligible to, to apply. What we'd hope is that you begin to interact with us and you see the value and, and you would want to, to, to interact uh, as a member of our organization. Um, the Sales Leadership Society really is, is the sponsor for, for this whole program. So uh, apply by tomorrow. Uh, we're trying to wrap up the application process and then we match you with someone that we believe uh, matches what you put in your application as your objectives. And then we'll send you an email that gives you a personal introduction to your program partner. And from there, you'll actually log into a tool called Mentor City, which is a technology tool that we use to facilitate these kind of confidential and, and ongoing re relationships over the six month period. And uh, once you've logged into that tool, then you can begin to interact together um, online as well as in person and video conference. Um, once a month is sort of the requirement uh, or, or the objective, but you can certainly meet more often than that if you want. The only thing we ask is that you be respectful of each other's time. Uh, don't don't you know overcommit and underdeliver. Just make sure you, you show up for meetings, and if you can't, you reschedule and, and and stay faithful to that. And then we also ask you to give feedback throughout the program. So if it's working well for you, be sure to to talk about that with us because we can use that um, as inspiration for us. If it's not working well, or there's something you think we could do better, please let us know that as well throughout the program. And then we'll also send a formal survey at the end uh, in November December timeframe. And I think that's it. Back to you, Blake. Awesome. I appreciate it. Um, also, I wanted to highlight our annual Tag Sales Leadership Awards. Uh, we originally had this scheduled for May 6th of this year, but due to COVID-19, we have since pushed it back and are forecasting sometime in fall of 2020. Um, we will have more details for you uh, as, as dates start unfolding. But the, the program itself or this particular award ceremony is our largest event that we host each year. It's built to recognize and celebrate um, sales leaders across the Atlanta community. Um, while we cannot uh, or haven't had the, the awards yet, um, we do encourage you in the meantime to uh, recognize and, and celebrate those that you think are, are worthy. We, we do this across um, six different categories of nominations. We've got large enterprise, somebody managing 800 or more sales employees uh, and or 500 million or more in annual recurring revenue. We also do a medium sized group 150 to 799 sales employees and or 50 to 500 million in annual recurring revenue. Startup growth stage, five to 149 employees or five to 49 million. Uh, we've got an inside sales leader of the year, sales operations leader of the year, and our Barb Giamanco community leader, uh, which recognizes a sales leader who's bettered the community and ecosystem across Atlanta. Um, so again, Re uh, nominations are open. We, we would love uh, and encourage you to nominate those that you see fit for any one of these categories. We want to celebrate the accomplishments, hard work uh, of those that uh, deserve it in the Atlanta community. With that, I want to introduce uh, today's guests, um, starting with Kyle Todhill. Um, he's the CEO and managing partner of eHire. He has uh, built this uh, tax society really from the ground up. Um, he served as chairman and co-chair over several years and will be acting today as our MC and moderator. Um, so with that, Kyle, I'll, I'll pitch it over to you, let you introduce the rest of the group. And real quick, one other thing, uh, should y'all have questions throughout this entire discussion, um, we are going to open up the floor at the tail end of the um, event. We only ask that uh, you designate your question to one of the panelists so that we don't have everybody talking over each other. 
um, just put their name in parentheses followed by the question and that'll help us redirect and, and address it as needed. Thanks guys. Uh, I just narrowly avoided a total child interruption <laughs> into my office. So that timing worked out well. I apologize for that. Um, um, so uh, today, you know, number one, I want to lay out the rules of engagement. Um, hold on one second. Sorry. There we go. My oldest just dragged him away. My four-year-old. Sorry, guys. Um, I want to lay out the rules of engagement for, uh, for this event. Number one, we're going to do uh, each one of our panelists today is to have a little bit of a presentation about kind of their observations, uh, what's out there in the marketplace and what's happening. And we've got three unbelievably distinguished guests here that are going to give you a pretty wide perspective on what is working and their observations and what the recommendations are. So hopefully today we get to learn something uh, about how we can pivot and, and how we can take our own sales organizations and learn from these lessons and apply them to our own teams and get better. Uh, so if you have questions, which you inevitably will, we're going to have a session at the end of this where, uh, where you're going to get an opportunity to post some of those questions and, uh, and, and then I'll review those as the MC and we'll ask those to individual uh, panelists. So my only ask is that if you have a question uh, for one of us, make sure you name who the question is for. Uh, again, we're going to go through kind of a, 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 each panelist is going to go through their, uh, their small little presentation and then we're going to go through some questions that I have prepared and then we'll open it up for questions for the floor. But I'm really excited today. I want to introduce Josh Horseman. Josh is a partner at SBI. SBI is one of the world's premier sales and revenue consulting companies. Uh, Josh has uh, over 23 years in sales leadership experience, including being a VP of sales for, for Computer Associates, uh, as well as Novell, and, uh, and has been, uh, was the managing principal uh, for Sales Benchmark Index uh, during their hyper growth years. And I know that they recently uh, just partnered with a private equity firm and are scaling up to even greater heights. Josh has been instrumental in that and, and uh, is truly an unbelievable guest to have here today as an expert. So we really appreciate him coming in. Derek, uh, well known to the Atlanta community. Derek Grant is the SVP of sales uh, for SalesLoft. Um, and not only running a large organization on his own, but he also has exposure to over 3,000 sales uh, organizations that that sales loft serves so his observations and the data that he's going to present today is critical from a tactical perspective uh derek uh you know is uh was number seven right on deloitte's fastest uh, growing company list and, and it was sales loft and that's one of the big accolades he has he went to fsu so we won't hold that against him but in 2017 derek won our uh, inaugural our inaugural sales leadership uh, award for growth companies so Derek uh, was instrumental in the development of Pardot from startup phase through their exit. So uh, we really are blessed to have somebody with a level of experience and, and exposure that Derek has. So looking forward to that. And then finally, Elton Hart, who actually just recently joined our sales leadership board. Um, actually, this uh, I think in the first quarter. Um, first thing I'll say about Elton is he's from Kansas City and, and uh, he's a Kansas City Chiefs fan. So we don't get to see too many of those here in Atlanta, but we congratulate you. It seems like 20,000 years ago that they won the Super Bowl, but that was quite, quite a deal. So uh, he's also an MBA from University of Georgia and uh, served uh, the United States in the Navy. So we, we thank you for your service, Elton. Uh, he is a vice president of market development uh, for this SMB market for Comcast business. And to give you guys some sort of scale, uh, the central division of Comcast, which is headquartered here in Atlanta, um, is a $20 billion division of Comcast. So he has a scaled uh, organization and really has been there since, I guess, for 12 years and has really brought their, their, their B2B marketplace and offering to the marketplace. So he's seen the entire evolution and been incredibly instrumental in bringing that to bear and has had a ton of success and has a lot of key observations about how their organization has had to pivot and what's working inside of their company and what they're doing to overcome. And they've had unbelievable success, uh, you know, transitioning to a, from a total, pretty much an external sales organization into an inside sales organization, which obviously all of us are now. So uh, really excited about that. Great panel today. Looking forward to the discussion. We're going to start off with Josh. Uh, and Josh is going to kind of take us through his observations and he's going to share his screen. I know he's got a, a slide for us. So take it away, Josh. Great. Thanks, Kyle. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, you know, just 
this, before I jump into the slide and some observations and trends that we've seen in the marketplace, just take a step back and if you close your eyes or visualize where you were in January 1 of this year, right? Some of you came off great years. Some of you had a lot of pipeline, a ton of forecast. Things were going great. You're ready for the new fiscal year. Fast forward about, call it 10 to 12 weeks from now, from then, I should say, middle of March, right? You guys were maybe, some of you are on spring break. You were going into the end of Q1. You had a lot of momentum. Things were looking great. You guys were either in the, in the zone or figuring out how you're going to get to the zone in Q2. And then all of a sudden, the world changes as we know it. And no one in this world had a COVID-19 or pandemic playbook that they could just pull off the shelf and say, oh, yeah, I got this ready, and here we go, and off to the races. And that's really what you have to think about. Then fast forward from where we were in the middle of March to where we are today. That's about the same amount of time from January 1 to mid-March, from mid-March to now. It's almost about that 10 to 12 weeks. And what we've seen in the marketplace, there has been an entire shift. Everything now is, as you know, we've talked about this, you guys have seen it is the virtual world. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about today, and I've got a one slide that I'm gonna show you, is what we think about in regards to a framework. And I put this out there, I'll send this out afterwards. We've got a link to it on our website, but just, I'm not gonna go through every single box on here, but I want a couple of takeaways for the group here. We know that when things change, companies that have a lot of speed, they're agile, and they make data-driven decisions are the ones that come out of all the crises successful, whether it was 9-11, whether it was a financial crisis, whatever that was. There's a lot of really great learnings and the most important thing is how are you going to be documenting and taking these learnings and moving them going forward? Meaning we know that whether there's a spike in the fall, whether there's a spike next year, whether there's a new pandemic, there's things that companies, leaders more importantly, have to adjust to. So what you see on the screen here is just some examples of the five things or so that we think are pretty tactical for the leaders. Now we've got a bunch of frameworks and SBI as a management consulting firm has a lot of frameworks. If those of you guys know us, revenue growth methodology is the way we think about the world of revenue growth. But we came out with some frameworks right after COVID hit. And the one I'm sharing today is one that we built for sales leaders. And a couple of things I think to highlight. Number one, if you're thinking about across the top, from left to right, drive clarity. And what we mean by that is how is a leader driving clarity down through the organization? And one of the big things I can think about is the fact that your customers are changing. You don't have to go on, you know, on those sales calls anymore where you're bringing four or five people. There's no longer a happy hour right now. There's no longer a in-person dinner. Things are moved to those versions of happy hours being virtual or social gatherings being virtual. So understanding that customer behavior. And one of the things we talked about very early on is you need to figure out the voice of the customer and where things have changed. If you move over to the second box around the operating cadence, the big thing I can tell folks that are gonna be thinking about how do I best move forward in this new normal? What are the daily objectives? And frontline management is even more important today than it was going into the year or any time in history. So those frontline sales managers, how are they setting their sales teams up for success? What are the daily, what are the behavior leading and lagging indicators? So when I pick my head up at the end of a week, I have my coaching call and I talk to my coach and I say, hey, this was a great week and this is how and why it was a great week because I have those indicators, those daily objectives that I'm going to be focused on. As we think about the performance conditions, it's all around process and tools. You know, um, we're going to talk a little bit about tools today and technology. What are the processes and tools that now have to be changed? Whether that's a new buyer journey that because of the fact that you might maybe did demos in person or proof of concepts where you had somebody go on site, whether the touch points you used to have going forward are changed. You have to understand those processes and tools and how that affects that buyer journey. And more importantly, your now sales process that you're going to be following as an organization. And then the key to all that is enablement, right? What is the enablement you're going to be doing for your individual contributors? Whether that's leveraging technology, whether that's leveraging the time frame, you now have more time in the day because people aren't commuting, people aren't on trains, people aren't on planes. And the thing to think about now is it's great to say, yeah, productivity per head has gone up, but there has to be clear guardrails. That's one of the big learnings we've seen is everyone says, oh, well, if somebody's working from home, it's okay to set up a call at whatever hour in the day, whether it's early morning or late at night, but people have families, right? And as a sales leader and as a sales manager, you have to have those 
individual contributor guardrails and how do you enable that training for those teams? So I would say an enablement of, and understanding where and when you should be doing those coaching calls, virtual, right? Face-to-face, -face, turning on your cameras. It's all about enabling those folks. And then lastly, it's all around the technology, right? How are you going to think about technology? There were layoffs, unfortunately. There's been furloughs. What are you doing around technology audits, right? Have you gone in and looked at your license counts? Is there a way for you to take some of those dollars and reinvest those into a technology that's going to drive better customer engagement? Digital has been accelerated. We've seen a big influx in digital. So how are you going to think about mapping those technologies to how you better enable your individual contributors and your leadership team? How are you going to map those technologies to better forecasting, better lead generation, better marketing demand, et cetera? So, I want to throw this slide up just to kind of give you a sense of where to think about strategically at the cross the top, and then more importantly, some of the tactical things to think about as you go through the execution and, and hopefully over the next couple months come out of this. We know there's going to be a hybrid shift back to some, site, some type of field interactions. You know, we get asked that a lot. Hey, when are we going to go back to having people visit clients or visiting prospects? I think it's probably going to be towards the end of the year, beginning of next year there will always be a bigger virtual selling organization going forward. Buyers have adapted to it. Inside sales has proven the model works, but I think there's not always going to be just virtual. There will be a hybrid coming back and the organizations that understand the virtual methodologies are going to be the ones that be successful. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Cal. Thanks, thanks so much, Josh. That's, that's awesome. I appreciate that. You know, uh, where can our, our, um, our guests get that slide? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it out to everybody. I'll send it over to uh, Rebecca. She can get it out to everybody. We set it up on our website. So if I get a chance, I'll throw it in the chat. If not, we'll uh, make sure all the attendees can get it. Okay, great. And if you wouldn't mind putting your contact information on that, I'm sure everybody is going to have some individual questions offline. But thank you so much. All right, our next guest, Derek. Derek's going to kind of walk through some observations as well. Um, I think, Blake, you're going to drive on the slide. Okay. Great. Well, Thank you so much for letting me uh, be part of, of this great event. You know, uh, at SalesOft, we're blessed to work with a ton of sellers. And so our data science team has gone out and done some research into what's working right now. Because let's be honest, the world is different today. And some of these genies are not going to go back in the bottle. Uh, and, and I wanted to talk about just some, some tips and not necessarily tricks, uh, but, but just ideas to infuse into your go-to-market and communication process with your prospects to be able to drive some results. And, and I'll start with the fact that the exaggerated death of phone is not true. Phone is actually impactful. We have to think about how people are using it, and people are now using their mobile device. But something that we found to be really, really impactful uh, with a 60% connect rate is double dialing. Now, some of those of you who have been double dialed, you may say, yeah, when I pick up the phone, though, I'm mad as a hornet. Fair. But with that said, what you want to do is break through the noise. Uh, second one is letting someone know you're going to be really, really sensitive about their time. Because let's be honest, you know, uh, we all have got uh, kids in the house. We've got, uh, you know, uh, other things that are going on, a spouse that maybe we're, we're, you know, in the same room with. And so just saying like quick question is a really has a really big lift right now. And it's being used. We looked at over 5 million emails and it was only being used in 0.01%. Think about infusing this into your process. Just let them know you're going to be, you're going to be brief. Checking in. Now I will tell you, I would throw my laptop at a rep who would send a checking in email in different times. Because checking in adds absolutely no value. However, at this point, it's something that can, can be open-ended and spark a conversation. Did the, did the deal go quiet? Is the CFO uh, flown in and has prevented any additional, uh, any additional purchases at this point? A checking in and something that it can be a little personal. It, it, it doesn't have to be agenda-centric. Just want to make sure you're good. Would love to have the opportunity to catch up when this cloud eventually runs out of rain. And so those are some things that you can do to be able to engage. In the, and then one more slide. Uh, with regard to, to language, language is critically important. And the words that you use inside of these techniques is really powerful. And so, number one, I don't know if you guys heard, there's a pandemic. Yeah, everyone's heard, right? You don't need to lead with COVID. If you do, you see a substantially lower reply rate on your email. Everyone gets it. We are all in this together. And so that is not something that requires you to call it out. 
So if you are calling it out, stop it because it is hurting your engagement rates on messages. Uh, also, you know, we think in terms of being a partner, not a vendor, and we've used that language for a long time. Let's be honest, a vendor is going to shake them down because they're 30 days overdue on their, on their invoice. A partner is going to figure out a way to work with them. Talk in terms from a relationship perspective of being a partner, a partnership actually has substantially higher engagement rate. And then use the word ho hoping. This is one that you'll want to put into the first 100 characters of your email or the subject line. You think about it, we're all consuming our content now on a tiny screen. And so you don't want hoping to be somewhere way down in the email. Lead with it. Really hoping you're okay. Really hoping that we're able to get this project back off the ground. Those sorts of things can actually be hugely impactful. Just some simple language choices that our data science team has shown uh, can really help drive response rates and engagement rates with your customers. And so with that, uh, I'm excited to turn it back over to Blake. Uh, and if you guys want, I can put a link to this out in the, the, uh, the chat as well. And then you all feel free to reach out if there's additional questions we can answer around that. Thanks, Derek. Hey, listen, is there, is there a resource that you guys have on your site that has a lot of this data you guys are starting to collect? I know, I know you guys are pretty cool about publishing a lot of it. So, uh, so a few different places to go. Uh, a good follow on LinkedIn is Jeremy Donovan, and he does a Hey Salespeople piece of content. You'll see this being something he, I talked to him just the other day, and, and he's got a new data set, and he's uh, driving results out of that. Uh, also, our blog is a great resource, uh, the Sales Off blog. Uh, we've posted some data around engagement in the era of COVID, opportunity creation in the era of COVID, connect rates, calls as opposed to email. So a lot of data out there as well. Uh, to your point, Kyle, we don't have it in, in sort of a single spot, but this slide deck, glad to share that, and that'll at least uh, start the conversation. Awesome. So what we'll do, uh, obviously, is, is when we do a little wrap-up, we'll bring in the SBI content and, and Derek's content, any resources, Elton, and put that into a single try to put it into a single sheet or a single set of sheets so that we can send that out to the audience so they can have a takeaway. Uh, if any of the panelists or guests have any good resources they want to post uh, in the chat, let's do it. Uh, okay, our next guest, Mr. Elton Hart. Um, love to hear your observations of the scaled organization and the change and transformation has been pretty awesome. Yeah, so as Kyle pointed out at Comcast, um, when this thing hit, luckily we've got some pretty amazing leadership as this started to to build in January and February, leadership started to, to prepare for kind of a, a worst case scenario. And, and lo and behold, here we are. But that being said, we were able to bring over a thousand sales reps within 24 hours going from door to door sales instantly overnight into, um, into a virtual environment, which had its own list of challenges, as you can imagine. So what we saw was um, the, the customers out there uh, in having to embrace, right? So this is the first time in history where salespeople and the decision makers were thrust into a new environment, right? We were all thrust into this. And you could say that even those lagging individuals were kind of dragged into this environment, which is great for us because we're all in tech. And with the, but the one thing, great, I got a Zoom. Great, I got a Teams. Now what? And what we found was a lot of what Derek said is we started to see these, uh, these pieces where we were seeing, hey, they're just looking for answers. They need help, right? And as a technology, we leverage technology experts as, hey, where are the SMEs? Let us help be the conduit between where you are today and what this new world is. And, and, and there's a pun in there for, for Comcast as being the conduit, but what we really saw bandwidth, right? The big talk was connectivity. So for us, it was a nice connectivity, but that wasn't the end of the story. The story was, you know, okay, now I'm connected, now what, right? So those, the top reps were able to take that and have those conversations, just like Derek talked about. Hey, I'm hoping you're doing okay. Here are the different things. And what we did is we took information that was out there and just, just sent them information about, hey, we hosted webinars across the, the, the Comcast footprint. And we just sent other information to say, hey, this is what we're doing. Oh, by the way, as an organization, we're not turning anybody off. We know this is a hard time. So our message was more around how can I become, people out there are looking for us as technology subject matter experts. And that is where we were getting, we were getting the, once we could get them on the phone or on this, the meeting, 
that's where they would be leaning in. And we would ask those truly solution driven questions and using the right vernacular, um, even to the, you know, one of our favorite things at Comcast is to say, hey, this takes about five minutes, five to 10 minutes. If I'm there any longer, it's because you want me there, which is a great way to break that ice because nobody has half an hour, but everybody's got five minutes. And if, if you're, like, you're like me, I don't do anything in five minutes, right? So, but you're going to want me there because once I can get in there, I can show you that value. So that's kind of what we saw out there. And from a tactical standpoint, from, uh, from biz business services and Comcast, it just became follow-up. And we leveraged technology to, to handle that follow-up because our volume went up. It wasn't face-to-face. -face. You can blow me off on the phone and an email a lot easier than knocking face-to-face. -face. So we had follow-up as our biggest piece. And we were able to take tools that we're using today, such as the 5-9 five, dialer, and pivot that to our sales team and, and load things into our funnel and be able to follow up. But where we saw success were two things. Those reps who were leveraging multiple touch points that SalesLoft has mastered, right? Touching on LinkedIn, touching an email, touching on a phone call, double dialing, following up that way, but making sure that you bring some kind of value. What we preach and talk about and train every single day is, if you're not bringing value to that decision maker, don't even make the phone call, period, right? And this is the prime opportunity for us, no matter what it is, find out what that value is. Um, and in fact, we actually went one, one step further as a best practice for our company. We invited customers into phone calls. We have weekly calls with all of our sales staff. We brought in a realtor to come in and talk about what are the pain points that you're facing right now during this crisis. We brought in automotive. These are decision makers coming in and going, and none of them talked about price. All of them talked about value and how do I leverage technology? Because most of them are looking at it and going, this is a lot of information. I'm just learning Zoom for the first time. I don't know what this does. So being the subject matter expert and the conduit has, is the piece. So follow up and then being that subject matter expert. That's really where we've seen people be able to move the needle. Awesome. Uh, thank you all. And we're going to move into a couple of canned questions that I kind of have uh, for the for the panelists. I shouldn't say canned. They're, they're informed off of the conversation. Um, and then we'll move into the Q&A from the audience and hopefully get a lot of that. My first, my first question is, um, Elton, you know, one of the things that even eHire has, has had to deal with is we have a field sales rep model and we have an inside sales model, right? And so um, what are the big challenges that you've seen in terms of change management, in terms of taking your external salespeople or your enterprise salespeople or your field salespeople, and they may be 5, 10, 15 years removed from being an inside salesperson. Tell me how you've addressed that issue with them, because I found that change to be a, a difficult process to revert back to reawakening their inside sales at roots, right? Well, I, I got to say, I mean, it's very much aligned. Josh nailed it. It's, it's first off, from a leadership perspective, having the guidance and, and saying the clarity of here's where we're going. This is exactly, we haven't changed. We've only changed the tactic in which we reach out to the customers. So setting that, setting the clear course of direction and setting the expectations of a daily cadence. So what we did is we modified the cadence. So we, we gave clear direction. We set the parameters and said, this is how many phone calls because they were very hesitant to do this. They were very hesitant to do all of this. So what we did is we said, okay, and luckily we had embraced teams ahead of time. Everybody jumps on a team call, just like we're seeing right now. There's, there's six smiling faces on the screen I'm a manager muting everybody and going in between that. But we were able to give a sense of normalcy and cadence to the reps. And it, it took about 48 hours and then they were back on it and they got back into the rhythm. Um, and we, we increased our huddles, uh, end of day huddles and start of day huddles where we took real time information. But that, I know it sounds simple, but it really was is once you gave them structure, because let's be honest, when you're a field sales rep, you've got a lot of flexibility, a lot of, a lot of time, but you come back in and go, everybody's on a team meeting at nine o'clock. We're going to have our call from nine to nine 30. Here's what we're going to cover. Everybody stay on, make your phone calls. My expectations is 50 phone calls, load them into Salesforce. Boom, boom, boom. Once we did that, it, it, it was, it was almost one of those moments where you step back and go, wow. And I think um, 
Josh touched on it as well, where when we come out of this, if we can mirror what we're doing now, if we can add that to what we're doing in the field, we should see an uptick big time. So sorry for a long winded answer, but that's, that's exactly what we did. That's a really good, really good, really good answer. Um, so Josh, we talked about kind of, uh, you know, things that are happening now and you had mentioned uh, something about kind of your vision of, of, of what this is going to be looking like in the future. Uh, I agree with you. It's going to take some time for the world to warm up to uh, getting cold called again, uh, 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 knocking on a door. But in terms of inside sales and, and, and external sales, how should CFOs, CMOs, other key stakeholders start to look at long-term planning in terms of sales posture? Should they invest more in, in, in inside sales and building those capabilities? Uh, what should they do with their external sales force? I mean, obviously we're still early in this data set, but what guidance are you giving them as it relates to, to kind of a long-term planning mindset? And what, what do you think the vision is future state? Yeah, so I think the first thing to think about, and this is sometimes a, a, a tough decision to, to even think about or have, is the people that have moved from the field to virtual, are they really going to be the ones, if we stay in a virtual model, are they going to be the right ones to make it? And what I mean by that are some of the legacy sales teams that were out in the field, knocking on doors, pounding the pavement, they moved to virtual. And if your buyers and your organization decides to make a, a, a shift to keep more virtual, then those people, those, those sellers need to either embrace the technology, embrace the new role, or they might not be the right fit for the organization. That might not be, you know, that's a tough decision. That's, that's coming from leadership, right? And I think what you need to do is have the competencies defined. So virtual selling competencies, inside sales, very similar type of roles. Now what you see in inside sales is they went from being a lot of them being centralized within a center to now being remote at their houses. So there is a change there. Things such as, are they a self-starter? Do they have the environment to work? Can they embrace the technology? So I think you need to understand the competencies for every role in your sales organization, whether they're in the field or not. I think the other thing you do is think about a year or two years from now. How do you envision your customer journey changing? Meaning, where is marketing playing a role? Where is sales playing a role? Where is onboarding and customer success playing a role? If you keep, put the end in mind and work backwards, and start thinking about your typical racy who's responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. That'll help you map out what roles are going to be needed. And then you start to layer on top of, okay, if I've resegmented my accounts and I realize that hospitality and airlines or the financial services or the cybersecurity or whatever those industries are, you have to recalibrate how many people you need in those roles because the coverage is going to shift. And then you start to think about, okay, if I know my accounts, are they going to be serviced by somebody in the field if there's a hybrid? Or then go there from, here's where I am, here's the journey I need to get to, and work backwards. And I think that's the vision we're trying to tell people, that they need to start thinking, it's not just what's going to happen next month or next quarter, it's what's happening 18 or 24 months from now. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I think a lot of our clients have been stuck in tactical crisis mode, right? protecting what works, but all of a sudden you wake up and you're in the end of second quarter. And at some point you have to start thinking strategically, right? And I think a lot of sales leaders are kind of, uh, have been afraid to start talking to their senior revenue officers or their senior uh, C-suite officers about, hey guys, we got to start thinking about recruiting new profiles. You know, we got to start thinking about the transformation that our sales organization is going to have to go through, right? And that starts to create all kinds of pain they're like, wow, we just got done laying people off. I don't have any budget for recruiting fees. You know, starting to have those conversations is going to be critical to success because you're, you're right. We can't stay in this mode forever. We won't, right? It's not going to happen that way. Derek, I got a question for you. Um, one thing I've observed is that my emphasis um, on kind of my KPIs has started to shift top, more top of the funnel, yep. Part particularly for um, you know, my more field oriented salespeople, right? Because they, they would just come back and say, hey, look, it's all, it's all about results, Kyle, right? You know, at the end of the day, that's great, but I can't manage that anymore, right? Because, you know, I'm not in the office with them or et cetera. So speaking of the way you manage your team, what did you used to measure and how has that changed to what you're measuring now and, and your, how have your KPI shifted? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, philosophically, I've always been a mid-funnel metric guy. I look at revenue as being a lagging indicator, and I look at things like activities as being a leading indicator. I think in this era, particularly with polished salespeople, beating them relative to like just, just dogging them on activities 
is something where they could phone that in. They could literally go in and just do a half-hearted job and not have the mid-funnel result, which is the conversation I want to have. It's the op I want spun up. It's the intro that I need to get. And so I, I think so often I've looked at the mid-funnel, which is how many meetings, and then working back up. If someone has missed that number, then I start looking at the things above it. But that is really the check engine light. Uh, if that thing's red and you're doing a lot of activities, we may have a messaging problem. We may have a targeting problem. And so uh, the, the way that I've always thought about it is, is not necessarily activities need to be tracked, but it is the results that I'm looking for. And then if we don't have those, then we have a problem that we need to start looking back up the funnel into. We, though, I will tell you, you know, our, our technology allows people to be in more places. Uh, our technology allows people to accelerate the, the speed at which they're connecting with folks. But really similar to what, uh, to what Elton said, uh, we are literally morning and afternoon connecting and saying, where are we at on these KPIs? And we're doing 70 calls a day. Our AEs are doing 50. Uh, from the SDRs are doing 70. AEs are doing 50. And so we want to see that. But, I mean, again, it's, it's not hard to make 50 calls. And anyone out there who hasn't done it recently, try it. You can get by. It, here's a good trick. On a day when we're all back in the office and it's the day before Thanksgiving, tell them about it. when they make 50 calls, they can get, they can go home. They'll have it done before 11. It's incredible. <laughs> it's not hard to make 50 calls. What we want is them to make, to have three customer interactions, two meetings spun up, one op that's in the pipeline that is advanced to stage two. So think about those metrics and then what are the supporting behaviors that need to get you there? And so, you know, we're, we're still doing the, the standard activity stuff, but I think we're looking one rung down so that we don't alienate people who, uh, who maybe have been out in the field and they just think now you've turned them into a, into a, a high-paid SDR. Yeah, um, that's a great point. Okay, uh, Elton, this is going to be uh, for you and you guys, uh, Josh and Derek, I'd love your comments on that. One of the things that we've observed uh, sp specifically with a lot of our clients is fatigue um, and, and uh, this construct of being locked in my gray office that I'm in. Why I, that's why I have the background of Augusta. You're at Augusta right now. What are you talking about? I'm just taking a break from playing 12 in between, you know, an amen corner, no problem. Uh, but the fatigue yeah. associated with, with this particular, uh, you know, crisis and, and, and the concept that a lot of us are going to be in this mode for quite a long time, if not, if not permanently. How are you keeping people fresh? How are you managing that? Right, and how are you keeping people fueled? You know, and, and, and what techniques are you using to, to kind of just deal with that? I know I've dealt with it myself a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I, I don't think anybody on this panel or anywhere can answer that yet. It's too early, right? I mean, I know we're seeing some of the fatigue, but it's really about to set in because it's, it's coming. Um, we do see it. Um, what, what's interesting and what we're noticing and from a leadership perspective, I, 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 uh, I like to lean in on this as well, too, is I actually see more connection um, because we're in, our, we're in our environments, right? So what's behind you? Um, yeah. Everybody, you know, what's, what's, what's that on the wall? What's going on? You know, we've always got a kid coming in. We've got those things. Life is happening around us. I think it's actually helping with that. Um, and, and, and addressing the fatigue is, is just from a leadership perspective, driving it. And what we're driving to is, look, you got to take a break. You got to get up and get out of the house. You got to do that. And it's really our, our, our leaders are stepping up and doing it and, and almost holding the reps and the, and the other leaders accountable to what are you doing? Like, are you going to take some time off? You got to take some time off. And it's not just words. Right. Um, I'm up in my cabin right now. I'm still hosting calls right here. But look, I, this weekend, I am disconnected, guys, and I am disconnected. And this is how. So that's that's kind of how we've we've done it. Um, so I, I see. I love to hear from Josh and Derek. Yeah, I'd love to hear from all three of you guys. So Josh and then Derek. Yeah, I would say a couple things. You know, what Ellen just said uh, around getting out of the house, right? What are you doing to make some things more entertaining? You know, when this first came out, everyone was doing like showing their dog, showing their kids, showing their house. You know, they're doing they're doing all the video calls, and I think that's great. Continue to do that. You know, there's things like virtual wine tastings, right? Our, well, a couple of us are doing that in a few weeks from for uh, for something that we're going to do together as a firm. I think the other thing to think about too is. How are your clients? I, I would say this is the opportunity or clients and prospects where they've got time to really get to build those relationships. So a recommendation I gave people is go back 60 days from middle of March. So go back into the January, February timeframe. And what were you doing that was building those relationships? 
And how can you replicate that? Meaning, can you go out and get a gift card to Postmates or Uber Eats, send it to a client or prospect, and get on the phone at 6 o'clock on a Thursday, have some wine, have a happy hour, and do it virtually? So I think there's an ability now to also have those conversations and do them over video. And then I think more importantly is use other means of communication. We all get sick of doing video, but use text, use FaceTime, or better yet, pick up the phone and have a conversation where you don't have video on. So there's a lot of different things I think people just get so focused on. I got to do video. I got to do video. And then more importantly, what is your escape for you personally to relieve stress, whether it's exercise, whether it's doing a puzzle, whether it's spending time with your kids, your dog, build in those calendar breaks in your daily plan, block it off so somebody has to have a meeting right over on top of it and make sure you have those guardrails that I mentioned earlier. Those are things I think that have been successful. Awesome. I know Sales Loft has a very specific set of policies around this. I'm very curious to hear you guys, how you guys have uh, enhanced it. I'm going to make the assumption everybody is sitting down before I say something that's going to sound really crazy. We're given Fridays, and I'm going to, I need, need to watch the fingers off. Uh, so we have said for the next two months, Fridays are off. Now, in sales, you don't really get Friday off because they didn't get a 20% lower quota. I think that's an important piece. The expectations are still there. However, the idea from a rest perspective is, and it, it really uh, aligns with what Elton was talking about, uh, it is to sort of force them to take a break, to sort of relax and, and take it easy. My wife, something, she, uh, she, her Apple Watch said the other day she'd walked 18 miles and she said, that's nearly a marathon. I'm like, you're really bad at math. That's not nearly a marathon. It's a long way though. Uh, but working and walking, I don't know if you all have taken calls when you're out. Uh, but, you know, just some sunlight. They talk about how COVID, it, it, you know, vitamin D is actually something that's really impactful against that outdoors you're le least likely to be impacted because you're not touching stuff. Uh, go and get outside. I think that's, uh, that's an important one. Uh, and then we, we've shifted almost all meetings that are unnecessary to LMS. We know that people, you know, I, 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 both Josh and Elton touched on it. They got family. They got commitments. They need to switch off with their spouse to make sure that the, that the family is, is not, that the kid's not burning down the house. And so not having standing meetings and moving a lot of the enablement content to a learning management system so they can do it at their time instead of me demanding an audience at 10 a.m. on a certain day has been, uh, has been really, uh, really impactful for us. That's awesome. That's really good feedback, and clearly it's an issue. So uh, Sales Loft, love the leadership there. Um, you hire people, don't expect Fridays off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But don't get any ideas, for real. Um, no, um, that's great stuff. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask the, the audience to go ahead and start posting some questions. Um, let's see. Let's see. I changed my personal goals. This is Act Direction. I speak with my own leadership. I'd love to hear more thoughts on the way you're thinking. Um, I'll answer that myself, uh, JD. Um, specifically, you know, one of the big uh, things that we had to do for our external salespeople was just start measuring deeper node activities that we're putting into the system and start to understanding that as just kind of a bulk uh, process. We had to learn, we, we know that our demand is off at least 40%. So we're in a pretty tough spot, right? Um, and so we had to start taking a look um, up funnel. Okay. Uh, that's not something that we had to do as an organization with a great amount of detail due to the amount of demand that we had in the GOAT economy. Right, uh, you know, there was a lot of things coming in. It was more about filtering opportunities than it was going to get them. To be perfectly candid with you, which was a, a great place to be, except there were no candidates, so it was a lot more difficult. So we had an inverted problem, but uh, now uh, the situation has reversed itself in a matter of weeks, and there's 38 million people that are unemployed, and a lot of them are pretty damn capable people. So our clients have uh, have, have started to focus on what what we would expect them to do, which is try to source people on their own as they hire and and be a little bit more difficult to, uh, to fill jobs with. And, and so we've had to focus on touches uh, with, uh, you know, with con conversations and actually start to retrain our people to be better inside salespeople, right? And that starts with learning how to run. It's like, okay, guess what? Being dragged out of bed one day and if you're not in shape and, you know, and I grab you and say, hey, we're gonna run a, we're gonna run a 10K today and we're gonna run 10 minute miles, you're gonna be pretty damn tired. So we had to start off with, we're gonna do a 5K, we're gonna do, you know, if, if, if that, that means anything and we're continuing to accelerate that and transform our organization into a, a into a more digital organization so i hope that answers your question so that was the adjustment that we made that seems to be working pretty well um, our people are developing those uh virtual sales competencies quickly we're doing a lot of coaching uh we're doing daily scrums already so we're doing that every day i know blake's team scrums twice a day 
So we're doing that uh, as well. And I also, by the way, um, have demanded that people take time off. I'm looking for at least one long weekend a month, at least, right? If not more and making sure that they do that. Okay, so uh, Blake, you wanna help me with these questions as well? So you can stay ahead of them. Um, let's see from, from uh, Eric. Um, now that Zoom skill set has been honed, how do you see the virtual option being leveraged uh, when we do, in fact, get back to a, an old normal? And how do you see that transferring into a larger scale, scale interactions like sales kickoffs? So I'll ask, uh, I'll ask Josh that question. Yeah, I think, I think virtual is going to be here to stay. I and mean, we've seen a shift already prior to this where inside sales is becoming more and more important, right? And I think buyers have changed. Uh, and I think as far as sales kickoffs go, there's always going to be a need for some type of a kickoff. The thing around the kickoffs, and, and you know, this is just my own personal, I think what we think as a best practice is, what is and a kickoff is not an event. A kickoff is something that you do to accelerate revenue growth going into the next year. So whether you do that in person or not, uh, there's always going to be a need for some type of a summit or a kickoff, whatever it is. But more importantly, it's not just that event. It's what you do going forward. And that can be virtual. The thing you need to do is how do you get people on a video where they're not multitasking, doing emails, doing some other things. And that's the reason that I do it in person is to get that one-to-one -one relationships. If you can do it, then great. Um, I think maybe some of the ones we're seeing are going to be geography based, based, just based on where you are in the country. And is it safer in certain areas of the country versus others? That's going to probably happen. Are you going to be doing it where you break up teams where there's not as much risk in infection if it does get to one team versus another? So there might be some of that. So I think there's going to be, we don't know yet what's going to be the new normal, but I think the old normal is going to be getting four or five, 6,000 people together. I don't think that's going to happen anytime in the near future. It's going to be more of those smaller functional geographic, wherever that might be that is going to take place for kickoffs. That's great. We got a question from Jeff Osborne, um, who's a great uh, customer success operator in Atlanta and has been working for Cox for many years. I know Jeff well. Jeff's asking uh, about a strategy, especially an initial strategy, in terms of shifting your focus from an acquisition focus to a hunting focus. Eric, uh, I'd love to hear your and Elton's thoughts on that. And I know SBI pushed that out as V1 of the COVID-19 response, which is focus on the customers that you have, retention, retention, retention. Derek, Elton, talk to us a little bit about kind of that shift and, and that customer success shift that you guys have had to go through. So I can tell you from a sales law perspective, we do quarterly OKRs and one this quarter, our, our number one value is always customers first, but we are doing embrace the base. And to your point, I think that your existing revenue is the most important. And for us, that's uh, being accommodating from a, from like a payment perspective. It is, it is adding more value, fine tuning the system, more office hours, more trainings, uh, these different sort of things, because quite honestly, uh, if you're not, if bookings have slowed and you're also leaving the back door of churn open, it now is a double death blow to you. And so it's really, really critical to go in and love on those customers, add a ton of value to those customers. Uh, to expand your footprint in there, to get the power, to make sure you've got access to the executives. That's a really important piece, and that's something is a corporate OKR for us, uh, particularly in just this sort of odd economic time. Yeah, we, we, we immediately implemented a health check um, and had our uh, reps. So our reps are assigned zip codes, and we like to think of ourselves as mayor of your territory. So this was an excellent opportunity to check in uh, with those individuals. I will say that we had to thread the needle between checking in and wanting to lower your bill and uh, making sure that we're providing, you know, hey, these are the, these are the things that we can provide for you. So it was, we really, uh, we did a pretty good job threading the needle, but we did have an, uh, an impact on overall revenue. But I, I think we'll see a dip, but we'll also come back as these individuals, you know, no matter how this goes, um, healthy, healthy resurgence, if they're gonna need to expand their services as we have new services, we've actually come back to them. We've had a touch point. Um, you know, that's one of the mortal sins of all salespeople is you never talk to anybody again. So this touch point we feel will help them in the long run. So we may see a short term dip, but the relationship is, is strengthened and we'll be able to, to, to accelerate those uh, wallet share for us in the future. 
Awesome. Um, all right. So I got a couple questions here uh, before we wrap up. Um, Adam, uh, uh, Adam Miller's got a couple, but I want to ask the last one first and then we'll go to the other one. Uh, Josh, can you expand a little bit on uh, voice of the customer that you mentioned earlier and kind of the customer journey? Can you give us kind of a summary of how you look at that and, and, and tools that you use to, to map that stuff? Yeah, sure. So when I say voice of the customer, uh, during this, you know, this new change in the buyer behavior, so most organizations, if they haven't already, this is a great opportunity to go out and build the buyer journey or the customer experience. So think about on a whiteboard from the time that the person goes into the market, even before that, what is the information that they're consuming before they get to you, but that journey that they follow. And what you should be doing now is going back to your customers. We just talked about embrace the base or we we came up with you know retention is the new growth i mean there's all these different things to go back and and have these conversations that information needs to get funneled back into marketing and product and so that those personas that you sell to you should be about you should be documenting them right what is the buyer that you have what is their title what are their challenges what are their metrics what are their goals what are their obstacles you should be understanding what that is so when i said voice to the customer it's having those conversations getting customer success Every organization has some touch points that are happening. You need to bubble that information back in in the closed loop system, capture those learnings, and then more importantly, get it out to the sales, marketing, and anybody touching a customer because that becomes the way you approach, the way you build the content, the way you go to a process for them in sales. So that's voice to the customer and you should be updating that now because of everything that's been going on. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to try and combine a couple of conversations, uh, that, uh, questions that Adam has pushed out in the sake of time. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about sales playbook, right? And a lot of things go into building that new sales playbook, right? Um, like average sales cycle that's changed recently uh, or average uh, revenue per, per unit or, or per, per transaction, right? Uh, and the data that's driving that. Derek, can you tell us a little bit about how, you're, have you, how you augmented your playbook and what examples you've seen based off what data? I will tell you that what we saw is we look at, uh, at Q1. So demand was up, uh, both marketing, reallocating resources uh, to be able to drive inbounds from events, as well as SDR. Like there's people want to have conversations. That's what we saw. However, we saw, and let me just pull the exact stats here so I can tell you, 29% uh, of, our, of our ops that moved out of, a, out of Q1 were moved due to COVID. And so what you saw was, there's demand at the top, but then there's, there's shakiness below. Deals are as hairy now as they've ever been. Uh, and so a few of the things that we've done, uh, number one, we're back to basics. Things like a mutual plan, key success criteria. I mean, I'm the commercial guy. I'm not doing the million dollar deals. I'm not doing the multi-stakeholder sort of thing, but you need to be able to really be definitive about how you're a painkiller, not a vitamin. We also have created a CFO ROI engagement deck, which is around being able to, to provide data to uh, the CFO and bring them in. The expectation is our second stage. Instead of the CFO who wields immense power right now, killing your deal at the 11th hour, I'd rather get a no quickly than get it slowly, quite honestly. And then we also built out some COVID pricing plays, things like uh, flexible billing terms, things like uh, extended time on the front side, uh, things like, uh, like we, we even rolled out one that I thought was really, uh, was really novel. We call it relief seats. And so it is the ability, you can get basically a, a steeply discounted for a short term uh, of sales loss seat if you already have an instance. It's something to be able to help embrace our base because we know what, what they need to add, but they're shaky on their side too. Uh, and so those are some of the things we did, but ours was really pricing plays, uh, CFO plays, and then back to basic type of plays to be able to make sure that we are running every deal as tightly as possible. That's awesome. Uh, Elton, you want to comment? So I, I think about this and we get this question a lot about playbooks and different exits. Look, the behaviors don't change, right? The sales behaviors haven't changed. I mean, the consultants will call it one thing. Another consultant will call it something. You got to, you got to, you got to, you got to prospect, you got to engage, you got to discover, you got to position, right? You got to do all that. So that doesn't change. The tactics in which you do it do change. That is really the only thing that's a modified from a playbook perspective and, 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 and how you follow up. So it really is, I mean, look, peel back the onion on every great salesperson, they just execute on the fundamentals. It's as everything in life, right? You execute on the fundamentals, you're probably an elite at whatever you do. So executing on that and the technology just allows us to be more efficient with that easier follow-up, 
uh, automatic follow automates those mundane tasks of email follow-ups and phone calls. So for us, it's just executing on the playbook we have with the slight, slight tweaks, like bringing in a product like sales loft to help us um, pilot that program or a Veloxi or something like that. All that's doing is, is helping us with the behavior. If we don't have that behavior, doesn't matter. Awesome. Well, I think that uh, pretty much wraps it up. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I know everybody's got tight schedules right now, but I wanted to thank our panelists, Josh, Derek, and Elton, and Blake for putting this together. I also want to thank TAG uh, and Rebecca Markinson, who's been instrumental in doing this. And I got to say that TAG has done an unbelievable job of stepping into the breach and, and, and providing uh, you know, uh, virtual events and virtual learning and bringing our community together so that we can share and learn together. And I, I can tell you guys as panelists, that our audience improved today, that they got, they learned things today or got things confirmed uh, that they were doing uh, that let them know they're on the right track or help point them in the right direction. Um, so without any further ado, I don't think we have time for uh, comments, but I just want to say thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for who showed up today. Thanks guys. I appreciate it very thank much. You. Take care.